So our next talk is uh, from Dr. Laura Toni. So Laura is a lecturer in the lecturer in the electrical and uh, electrical engineering department of uh, UCL, where she leads the learning and signal processing lab. And um, she 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 has uh, you know uh, quite a bit of a background on uh, multimedia systems and communications, and more recently on uh, machine learning on these aspects. Uh, she won a couple of best paper awards. One of them is an ACM based paper award. Uh, and Laura, as I said, her background comes uh, from uh, you know multimedia communication, so a bit more distant to to what we do here, the physical layer communications. So hopefully, you know, Laura can open up our minds a little bit uh, in this area. So I think you know, yeah, with this uh, easy task on your shoulders, Laura, I think I'm I'm, I'm ready to hand over to you. Thank you, Christos. So I think I can just. Uh, or Lorenzo, you have to toss the ball to Laura, or I can do it. Yes, I'm going to do it. Yeah. Now you should be able. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And we can see your screen. Yeah. And now you can still see it, right? Yeah. Okay. Just let me. Okay. Okay. So hi everyone. Um, yes, as Mikael said, uh, I'm not a pure physical layer person, uh, but I worked a lot on multimedia system and network optimization problems. So I thought that could be relevant to discuss today to you. So the title is, of my talk is AI and ML Foundation and Open Challenges for Intelligent Network Communication. Uh, yeah. And basically, I, I actually did think a lot on what to present today, and I try to think what could be the problems that you might be facing uh, in any kind of network design. And I thought that uh, I think main, main of the pro most of the problems come from the fact that in the past, network design were kind of uh, uh, settings in which you had the model, so whatever were the requirements, the, the, the user need, the end user, and any type of possible channel conditions. And your goal was to try to design the optimal, maybe adaptive model and network design that could fit this model. And, and, and there are many works in that. But what if the model is not really known? What if this model is constantly changing? What if without any a priori information, you still need to have optimal design strategies, right? So uh, this is what I think is the nowadays challenge, and this is of course a figure that most of you know very well because it's from the painless project. And the point is really anything that can, can be dynamic scenario or emergency scenario, so it's kind of coming uh, out from nowhere and you still need to have any kind of design, how do you ensure an optimality in these online settings? And this is what I would like you to understand today. So I will go very quickly in an ML framework. ML can be everything, so it's a very large framework and you would need an entire uh, CS degree to, to cover that. So we'll try to, 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 to go quickly in an introduction. And then I will focus more on, on what are the strategies or the technical framework to understand these online strategies. So how do you make decision and optimization online? Uh, if I have a chance, I will also try to then uh, introduce challenges that are what can you do when this decision is to make on large scale networks. So when you really have um, a special dimension coming into the picture. Uh, as I said, introduction to ML. Of course, I will be happy to answer any question at the end. I know it's not very interactive this, uh, this way, but I know that you will be chatting, so feel free to write and then I will try to answer all the question at the end. I will leave some space. So uh, you might have seen already a uh, basic introduction to ML. What I just want is to stress is the importance of uh, uh, the key concept of learning from the data. So any machine learning algorithm you will see, so also what you see today, but also more classical deep net framework, will have this framework of getting some, giving some inputs, developing a training algorithm in such, that I, in such a way that I can get a classification rule out of that, right? So a trained model that given a new input can tell me what is the actual output. In this case, a classification of the image. And this is really common to everything, every kind of ML framework. And the key definition of machine learning is really the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So the idea is the less 
um, input you give to the model, the better, right? So the less intervention you put yourself as a human being, the more the let you let the machine to learn, the better. And the key idea is that, of course, machine learns from the data. So the data becomes highly important, and uh, this is also what your network model might need to adapt, right? So to to the data that you experience, so the actual IoT designs or any possible uh, end user system or channel condition. And the machine learning idea or paradigm is to translate this data into knowledge. Uh, this is uh, a problem, uh, if a kind of framework that you will have for most of the ML problems. So you do have a definition of the problem. You do have a preparation of the data. Uh, data can be split into training and validation set. So with the training, you use this data to fit your model to this data. And then the, the, the test set is, to, is a way to, to see if your model is general enough in such a way that it works also very well uh, to, to data that you have never seen in the training phase. Uh, you decide what is your training model, for example, supervised learning regression model and anything else. And then you go into the actual training that is basically the, 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 way, the moment in which you do model fitting. And then testing, that is when you actually see if your model is general enough, okay? And this is something that, as I said, is very general, but is impressive how much this model applies to any ML framework that you're going to, to, to see or to experience. And I really want to stress the importance of the data and to understand that you need to have some data that you use to train in your model and some data to, to actually test and validate your model. Another important separation, and I wanted to mention because today we're focusing only on one of these categories, is which type of machine learning paradigm, paradigms do we have? Uh, machine learning could be supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. So today we're really focusing on this area of uh, uh, reinforcement learning strategy. Could you see my cursor, by the way? Okay. Uh, that is really the, 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 the machine learning sphere that uh, in learn how to make decisions and how to take decisions and how to optimize things uh, on in real time. But just to give you a hint, just again to, to give you a broader introduction, supervised learning is any type of category in which you have data and that is your input and you have labeled, so the actual output of this given input, right? So when you fit your, when you do your uh, data fitting, so you do your training, you will say train the, the prediction rule or train my algorithm in such a way this input will give you this output, for example, in such a way that I can recognize that this image is a cat and this is a dog, okay? And this is very uh, well used, especially in computer vision, where nowadays uh, state of the art is really outstanding uh, performance and accuracy level. And it usually involves classification, regression, recommender system, and anomaly detection. Um, it is also widely used now in, in, in physical layer optimization, for example, to denoising and, and, and some other of uh, the coding and, and the modulation input. So you might have seen some of this already. Unsupervised learning is a little bit more complicated task in which you do have the input, but you don't have the output. So you don't have the actual label of this training data. So what you need to, what the only thing that you can do is to actually, for example, do some clustering algorithm. So for example, to try to see what are the images that share some common properties. Uh, another thing is also to understand dimensionality reduction or also anomaly detection and recommended system. So I might still don't know exactly the label of this input, but if I only get always cat images, and then at some point I get an image of, of, of a horse, I might detect that as an anomaly detection. Of course, this is mainly used in finance and aspects like that, but that's interesting because it can also be highly used in network optimization in the settings of uh, uh, jamming and, and, and any type of uh, adversarial attacks to the network, so more in the sense of security aspect to, to the network. And then the, the last part is reinforcement learning. Uh, reinforcement learning is really the, the sphere of ML that is aimed at studying, um, let's say, at, at developing the autonomous 
aspect of AI. So really um, is this the, the framework that allows any system to make decisions independently and in a full autonomous way, in such a way that therefore the machine can actually be autonomous and intelligent. Uh, you might have seen some of the successes of machines playing AlphaGo, um, chess games, uh, of course, uh, you know, going around your house, uh, uh, hoovering your house, or these type of things. It's all based on, on, on this kind of technology. And what I'm going to show you today is how does it work? And then I also show some possible application, mainly some, some papers that also show how this has been applied to, to network strategies. So this is entering, um, so we now enter a bit more into the decision making strategies under uncertainty. That is the general hat that I give to reinforcement learning, and we're going to see now why. Uh, so some of you might have already quite some knowledge on, on machine learning, so you might be very familiar with these settings, that is the one that I also described before. Uh, of, for example, classification, right, in which you have an input and you want to say whether that's a dog or a dog, a cat or a fox in the image, right, depicted in the image. Different is the case in which uh, I might have an input, for example, in this case, a, a user asking for a connection, like a car, a, 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 a driving car, maybe self-driving car. Uh, and I still need to, to understand what is the, the decision that I want to make. How do I want to uh, connect this car or how this car should behave. So what type of decision is the actual output of my machine learning process, right? So it's not just a, a definition of what this is, but is how this, uh, how the input should behave. And that's completely different. And overall, uh, it's a sort of optimization of uh, sequential actions over time in such a way that I reach my goal, whatever is the goal that we define. And that sometimes is a sort of optimization, but the challenge in fact is that now we have no knowledge on the actual environment in which we are and the actual reward that I might get for each action. Just to give you some context, for example, one task could be how do I learn to play chess or how a self-driving car knows what to do in such a way that, of course, the, the final goal is uh, to, to reach a destination avoiding accident, right? Or also, how do I provide recommendation system in terms of Netflix? But as I will show you later, recommendation system could be highly also applied to online strategies for network optimization. So how can I do this if I don't know exactly what is the user preferences Netflix behavior or what are the rules of a chess game, right? So there is a component that is fundamental that is the uncertainty of the model that I would like to optimize to. And the uncertainty is what calls for an online learning. That is really anything that is a continuous learning in real time by trial and error. So it's a learning, observation, the outcome of, the, of my, my, my action, and then learning again. So it's a constant refining of your knowledge and re-optimization of your strategy. And that's really what it is and what is going to be discussed today. What's the difference between offline and online learning? Uh, well, offline learning is the case in which is the settings in which we have some data. We do any type of inferring from a data and then we do our optimization. And this is more in line with the first slide I had before. That is, you might have a model of a user asking for a type of connection or, or data that you need to send or, or requirements in terms of probability, error loss, or anything like that, channel condition, and you take your, your optimization model, your action, right? And an example of playing chess, that is an example that will be recurrent during this talk today, it would be like having a observation from which, so past games that people played with too, from which I kind of infer what is the instruction manual of, of the chess game, what are the rules, and then I make my game. Completely different is the, the, the scenario when I go into online learning. Online learning is really a loop. So it's a loop of, uh, uh, I have some knowledge, so some training data that give me my knowledge. I then therefore take some actions based on this knowledge. And then I observe what happens, for example, what the other opponent does in the chess game. 
And then this gives me further information. So it amplifies my training data set. And based on this, I refine my knowledge and, and, and I keep on going, right? So it's a kind of very uh, closed loop uh, uh, feedback loop process in which I never stop to refine my data and I never stop to refine my strategy. And this is what I just said. So it would be like the first time I need to play chess, I have no idea how do we play. I play a few times and I still don't get the big picture, but at least understand the key movement, for example, how pieces can move in the, on the board, right? But then I, I still lose, keep on losing, and because I still didn't get fully the picture of, of the game, but the more I play, the more I actually expand my knowledge in the actual rules and strategies, till the moment in which I can actually manage my goal, that in this case was, for example, to win a game. Um, and that is really uh, impressive because it is as simple as that, but as powerful have, as having robots really developing completely new chess strategies, but also new strategies in real life. And what I uh, find out, I, I approach this, this, this field working on network optimization, mainly at the Mac layer, not at the physical layer, but still in that sensor level. And what I realize is that many, many times you might need these frameworks. And this is why I wanted to, to give you a, a high level of this today, because they're really powerful and, and a lot of problems can be actually tackled by this. And specifically, they can be tackled by two different types of theoretical frameworks. One is multi r bandit problem, and the other one is reinforcement learning. They are um, similar as a concept because they are both in this loop of uh, online learning setting. The key difference is that in bandit problems, you have a decision that does not really affect the observation in the future, while in reinforcement learning, everything is connected. And we're going to see exactly now what does it mean. So let me first give you an introduction on multi arm bandit. So uh, it is called like that because it, it is as in a, let's say there is a, this kind of analogy of uh, you are in a casino and you want to play uh, a, a one of these machines, right? A, and you don't know which machine, so which arm to pull, but of course your idea is that you, you would like to win and to get rich, right? So the question is, uh, how much do I try all the machines? So I, ex I, I kind of trying to improve my knowledge or how much I think that one machine is the best one, so I keep on pulling that one because most likely is what will give you the, the, the actually reward, right? So there is this kind of trade-off. And, and the key point is uh, I want to learn this action and reward mapping in such a way that then, if I know that, I can actually pull the arm that maximizes the reward. And I have no model, no prior information. Usually you have nothing. And you can only try an error. So you can only start your trial and see what happens. And this is the key point of online learning. Uh, what is really good that is much more difficult in RL, in reinforcement learning, is that you have a simple model that is very uh, easily, uh, well, not really easy, but it can be processed theoretically. So you do have a lot of guarantees of uh, you will reach optimality in that amount of time, or you will have that suboptimality behavior. So you can understand what to expect, at least as, as a symptotic bound. So that's the really nice part of, of Bandit. It's fully explainable and, and, and it can be uh, theoretical uh, understood. You have a lot of applications. Uh, at the end of this section, I show you network applications, but here uh, the very, very most famous one are clinical trials in which you don't know which medicine or, or which type of uh, um, therapy would work with some given patients or disease. And even this is just trial and error. So you do have this sort of bandit problems in clinic, clinical trials. Another one that maybe most of you use nowadays is Netflix. So it's not that the current Netflix recommendation system is based on bandit, uh, because there is more an evoluted sense of that, but the key, uh, the key idea of recommendations can be applied, uh, can be uh, done by bandit problems. That is, what type of action, so what type of video I do recommend 
to given users. And if you start to Google it, you have no idea how many applications could be built on that. And as I said, the framework is as simple as this. You take an action, you look at the reward of that action, you then say, okay, I get more data set information, so therefore you update your estimate, and then you, um, based on new estimate of the actual rewards, um, action reward mapping, you take other actions and so forth. What's the beauty of that is that you need to have a, a, a constantly, you need to constantly balance if uh, uh, whether you take your action to increase your knowledge of the environment or to increase your probability of maximize the reward. These are two completely uh, things in terms of which action would you get, and this is what we are going to, to see now. Uh, specifically, uh, given a, an action, you, you do have a model that defines a reward as a function of your action. However, you don't know this reward. So in this case, this is a very simple linear settings, and you don't know the alpha parameters. And this is what you will try to estimate. Then, uh, what you are going to to do as a first step is to understand the uncertainty of the model. So let's assume that you are at the given decision opportunity T. So you have taken some action till now, and you have a, a new hat, so a, a, an estimate of your alpha hat, and therefore an estimate of your reward hat function, right? Uh, it is key to understand how certain you are about this uh, estimation, right? And so this is why you usually define the, you quantify the uncertainty that is usually the ellipsoid in, that is centered in your current model of alpha hat, so if your, of your current estimate. But with high probability, it contains the ground truth alpha, right? So the more you are uncertain of, so the less you are certain of the alpha hat estimation, the bigger will be your ellipsoid. While the more you are certain, the smaller will be this ellipsoid. And this has an impact because when you uh, want to take an action, what you simply do, this is the only math that you will see for bandit. So don't be scared by all these theoretical aspects. But basically what you do is at every time t, I need to take an action. And I say, I take the action that maximize my expected reward in which the alpha can be any alpha in this ellipsoid. So this is more for your information, how the problem becomes, but this is, the, this is the key intuition that you need to have. The more you are uncertain of the problem, the bigger the ellipsoid, so the more you still are suboptimal in your actions because you can explore more. And that's it. That's the only thing you need to understand about Bandit. Uh, because what happens next is you, you then observe, you take your action XT, and then you observe your reward. And once you, you have done this, excuse me, you go back to, okay, now you refine again your estimate, you define the ellipsoid bound that will we, we shrink and shrink over time, and then you refine again your next action, and so forth. So this is the loop I, I, I visually described before, but that's it. And it is really important, the fact that the only thing that is usually critical in, in, in bandits is you just need to understand this uncertainty. And it is called bandit problems, these kind of strategies are called optimism in favor of uncertainty. And why it's that? Because basically um, you will select actions based on, on this maximization. And let's assume that this is an alpha hat because it's the current estimate of the alpha. You will select an action either if this is very large, so if the estimated reward is very large, or if the second component is very large, so the uncertainty of your model is very large, right? So it's called, basically it means that you maximize, you will select the R, so the action, with the biggest or largest index and this is the index is the estimated reward amplified or at least increased by the uncertainty of that specific arm. 
So it's called optimism in face of uncertainty because we say, okay, I'm uncertain about this R, but I assume that it's actually bigger, right? The, the estimated reward is, the, the actual reward is actually higher than my estimate. And that's what is really, really, really important to get you an exploration exploitation trade off, uh, which means that once I am at a given time t and I need to take any action, I have a given knowledge of the model. And I have two choices. Either I say this is the model and this is the action that maximizes the reward in this model, or this is an action that would not maybe maximize the expected reward, but would increase my knowledge, right? Would refine even further the knowledge. So exploration is when I take action to refine my knowledge and reduce the uncertainty of my knowledge. Exploitation in which I take action in such a way that I make most of it given my current knowledge. And that it's what you have to balance. And taking action following this model of optimism in face of uncertainty will automatically balance this trade-off. So you don't really have to worry about it. And, um, and, and this uh, is, as I said before, the only thing that you actually need to know about Bandit because uh, uh, the only thing that you may also want to see is how to understand how my um, bandit problems perform. Usually, we estimate that as cumulative regress. So at time t, at time zero, I start to take my actions over time, and I take actions over time, and uh, I see what is the cumulative reward that I expect the experience. So what is the reward that I experience over time, and I compare it with the ideal one. So over, if, I, if I take action on a capital T horizon of time, uh, my, and every time if I were able to know what is my best strategy, so what, my best action that I would take, that is the average expected, the expected reward you would get. And this is what you actually get. So the difference is your regret, so how suboptimal you are with the choice. And the only thing that I wanted to mention is that the suboptimality, so your regret, can be bounded. So with this uh, big O notation, as you can see here, and it scales with k, k, that is the number of actions, and with capital T, that is the observation over time. And uh, that uh, the only thing you need to know about Bandit for a very, very, very first uh, basic introduction, let's say. Uh, so uh, before going to where you need that in, in, uh, in network optimization, just to wrap up, is uh, as you can see, uh, we consider cases in which you do have that each arm has a given reward. This does not depend on your previous action or anything. It's just a model, but you don't know this model. Right? So there is no for a connection, as you have seen, it's not that the reward depends on what you did in the past. No, there is a linear, for example, model that we saw uh, that depends on the parameters alpha that you need to estimate. That's it. So how you estimate it is you estimate it taking action over time. The key novelty of Bandit is mainly the fact that with this uh, uh, uncertainty index and optimism in favor of uncertainty, you do automatically balance exploration and exploitation trade-off, basically. You, you reach this trade-off automatically. And that seems quite abstract and theoretical, uh, but you will see, if you start to read a little bit some papers, that is highly used in every time you need to make an online decision, even in networks. So the first work, for example, is by Sabrina Mueller and Michaela van der Schaar. Uh, it applies bandit problems to, um, uh, to contextual caching. So if I have caching strategies, then I want that to be uh, um, autonomous in the sense I don't want to set the actual problems. I just want this caching to be refined over time depending on the actual context, so on the user's domain. So that's exactly just understanding, oh, excuse me, just understanding a mapping between my caching strategies and the reward. So, for example, in this case, if I correct uh, 
I remember correctly, the reward was uh, uh, the, the, the hit and miss in, in the cache, right? And uh, that's how they use it. So they use the contextual bandwidth problems. It's a little bit more refined version than what I show you, but it's exactly the same idea. Uh, another case is spectrum uh, scheduling. So again, uh, it's not exactly physical layer part, but it's still related to network optimization. And the fact that you may want to have a dynamic and constantly evolving uh, scheduling or sharing of uh, the spectrum. And again, you don't want to be doing that once or to set some predefined rule. You want something that evolves over time and learns from the data by experience. So you want something that is really key machine learning oriented. And this because the final goal is to have autonomous networks, agile networks that evolve per se. So even in this work, I put here some reference for your information. They do this with, uh, um, uh, with bandit problems. Okay. And this is a, okay. And this is a key first uh, um, introduction to online learning methods. Uh, Bandit is the first. And now we go more into reinforcement learning. As I said before, uh, reinforcement learning is one area of machine learning. And again, Bandit could be a simple case in which you don't have a time evolution of it, but it's still part of this reinforcement learning strategy that is an action reward driven. So the data now is action reward. So when we say it's a data driven algorithm, in reinforcement learning is an action reward driven algorithm. And it focuses on sequential decision strategies in which uh, we have this interplay between an agent taking action and an environment evolving based on this action. And at the beginning, I don't really know how this interplay works, and it is what I'm actually, the agent learns over time. So it's really a key concept of uh, learning in real time and improving my, my knowledge by experience. And this is something that everybody, each of us constantly does, especially the key example of reinforcement learning is a baby that he has no idea how to play with things or how to put you know, squares and, 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 and other type of shapes into boxes. But by trial and error, in the, end, in the end, you understand the concept, right? Or you understand the physics by dropping things on the floor and see that they fell down. That's really a key example on how our brain automatically process RL. And uh, okay, RL, is, is really powerful. It has been used in many AI concepts, and now it has also quite successful in application to, to network strategies, as again, I will show you at the very end. But it, it is applied really to many other possible aspects beyond also network. So it's robotic, healthcare, autonomous driving, financial trading, and many others. And what I would like to give you today is a is the key, the ground of how it works and what are the key concepts. Um, what's the main difference between classical ML algorithm that you might have seen already and RL? Uh, and RL? Uh, well, first, there is no uh, a supervisor. So there is no uh, somebody controlling and giving input and output. It's only a, a closed feedback, feed, feedback loop based on reward signal. Uh, sometimes this reward is delayed, so it's not that I get an input and I get an output. Is uh, an agent maybe needs to take a lot of steps before reaching a goal. And you can think about a simple example as a robot that needs to get out from a labyrinth or a maze. He will know if the strategy or the path is correct only once he managed to understand if it's uh, against the wall or if he managed to, to, to reach the exit of the labyrinth, right? And uh, another very, very, very important aspect compared to any other ML strategies is that inputs are not IID. So if you have a computer vision task, you have a training data set, and it, it still does matter a little bit the order of the images that you, 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 you fetch in into the ML, but let's say that 
in theory, all these inputs are IID. And if there are a, a very good uh, sample of the population that you are trying to infer, uh, it doesn't really matter the order to which you process the inputs. In, in RL, it does matter, right? So whether I go right or left, it depends on where I am. And where I am depends on what were my action before. So there is all an history that cannot be neglected in RL. And, uh, and, and basically, uh, this is because each agent actions as a consequence on the future. All right? And basically, the key uh, essential aspect of RL is, uh, and this dependency over time, comes also from the fact that the overall goal of an agent is to optimize a long-term reward. For example, the, 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 the robot in a maze wants to get out from a labyrinth. So it's not that I want to, 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 to get out from my square nail. Now, it's like in the long term, I want to get the reward. And that's very critical because sometimes you take actions that are not good for the instantaneous reward, but are good for the long-term reward, right? And these are two examples. So, for example, uh, you might be napping now in this, uh, in this talk, and that's very good for your immediate reward. Uh, okay, you will not have an exam, but maybe the, the knowledge that you have will be reduced if you nap now, right? So in the long-term reward of uh, over time, I would like to learn, uh, that may be not really ideal. And also in uh, refueling during a, a car racing, right? Uh, a racing car, uh, you have that it will not be good if you stop in that moment. So in that specific moment, uh, if you assume that the reward is uh, your ranking, uh, that may be a negative reward, but in the long term, it, it's what maybe helps you to, to win the race, right? So there is really a completely different aspect of uh, what is an instant reward and what is the final goal that I want to achieve. Uh, RL comes from um, some control and planning optimization strategies, but the key difference is that in classical uh, control planning, you do have uh, a knowledge of your model. And going back to example of the chess player, you have the manual of your instructions. So RL is the similar aspect, the, the, the same problem, but in the case in which we don't get to know any a priori information, or at least uh, not the, the key ones. So basically the rules of the games are unknown and they are learned over time. Let me tell you now, let's go a little bit into what defines RL. So the key ingredients of RL are the actions, the reward, and the observation. I mentioned this already a little bit, but let's go a little bit into the technical bit. So the reward is the feedback signal you get, and it tells you how well you did now in the specific current instant. And with the car racing example is what I told you before. It's like, uh, uh, the score, for example, of, of my ranking or my timing, and, and that's something that it kind of translates into chances for me to win or lose the game. Here there are many others that I also put more for your information in case you want to look at the slides also offline. Observation is a, uh, is a key aspect of RL that is the state. So the state, it's really a um, uh, full informative um, fully informative of your current state of the environment at the moment. So it's the information that tells you what's happening now. So for example, uh, if it's a robot moving around to a maze, the state could be your position, your coordinates. Uh, and uh, to give you more example, in the, car, in the racing car example, the state could be your fuel and uh, whether it's low or, uh, or high, and maybe also your, your time until now. So the key information that you need to know to understand the environment and to then get decision next. Actions are the decision that you take. And this is the mathematical model that you have. So you still have this interplay between the agent, so who takes decision, and the environment. So there are decision at time eight. So the agent observe the current state, receive the feedback from the past, and then execute a, an action. And then the environment, based on this action, will then evolve into a new state and will actually give 
a feedback in terms of reward. And that's the mathematical goal of RL. So we want to max optimize this sequential action in such a way that we maximize the long-term expected reward. So it's the, basically the reward at time t plus k, with k that goes from zero to infinity. So given that uh, at, give, at, at time t I am in a given state, and given that I will follow a given policy, we are going to see later what does it mean, what is the actual reward, and is expected because you usually have some randomness on the evolution of the environment, given some action. But this is your uh, reward. And an example that is very, very uh, simple and is usually is considered as a classical example of, of this uh, environment evolution is the inventory management problem. So let's say that you are a manager of a warehouse and you observe a current inventory of a single product and you, they, you need to decide how much um, you need to order in such a way that you don't have too many supplies, but at the same time, you are sure that you can serve any possible demand you will get. Of course, you don't know exactly what is the demand that you will get or the probability distribution, right? And you want to do not buy too much because that would have a high cost of the inventory costing. But at the same time, you also don't want to lose, sale, lose sales, right? So if somebody comes in into your shop and ask for something, a product, you would like to have it on stock. So how do I take my actions? And, and, and the model that I just showed you is going to be unfolded in what is usually called a Markov decision process that defines a state. In this case, the state is how many books you have left. Then there are actions. Each action can lead you to different state because uh, uh, you can say, okay, if I order one book, and then maybe in the meantime, I got one client, two clients, or three clients. This is actually how many books you will you will be left. So how many? So the states that you will get. Actually, sorry, these two step, two states should be one unicum because it's the same zero and zero. Another action, two books, can then give you to these other possible states, right? And what you so you have some actions and some uncertainty of the demand. And you want to unfold all this to then understand what would be the possible reward. This is the reward that you would get from each of these possible actions. And this is it. This is the model that uh, describes your key actors. Now let's see a little bit the key components. So I discuss about policy and model. Let's see them a little bit uh, in uh, deeper. I talked about um, long-term reward. Uh, technically, in reinforcement learning, what you get is the value function. So the value function is from a given state, given a, a possible action, how good the future will be. So how good all the next rewards will be. So it tells you how good or how bad the state and action pair is, right? And this is very important. It is actually the main goal of, of, of an RL agent is to understand this value function. Because basically, if you are sitting at a given state, so if you are in a given moment with a given uh, inventory uh, problem or fueling of your car or whatever is your state, uh, if you know that and you know how good is one state and action pair, you will just take the most promising one. And just to give you some notation, pi is the policy, so it tells you the strategy that you are trying to apply from a given state S and an action A. And sometimes you might say this gamma. So this gamma is actually a discount factor. So as you can see, it's a value that goes from 0 to 1. And the more I go into the future, uh, the more the more I I do discount this uh, reward, and why is that? Well, first is for practical convergence issues. If I have an infinite horizon of time over which I'm looking at, but also because uh, uh, the more I look ahead, the more I look ahead, uh, the less certain I, I am about what will actually happen. 
So in this way, I don't only look at the state and action that would maximize my instantaneous reward. I also look at the state and action pair that are most likely the most promising in the future, but assuming that I do have some uncertainty on the future. So I still want to wait a little bit less and less and less the future strategy. And the key uh, aspect of uh, reinforcement learning is that if you do your math, you can do it offline, but if you see this value function can be seen as a reward that I'm having now, plus gamma, this set of uh, summation of future rewards that can actually be seen as a state value function of the future state, okay? So you have this recursive equation that is the key core of Markov decision processing as and uh, RL problems, that is the Bellman's equation. And what is really important is that when I'm in a current state, I only need to see the value functions for, I, excuse me, I only need to see the reward that will happen in, in the future. So I take an action, I will get a, a, a reward, and then I will end up in a state where this is, a, how promising is that future state. So I don't have to think about what will happen next, because I already have this QS prime, a prime step in which I will be able to, to see how good is the step in which I'm, I'm landing to. And that's really important because uh, if you know the transition probabilities, so you are in this mathematical framework of uh, what I showed you before, for example, of the inventor management tools, uh, you can solve this equation with dynamic programming because it really exploits this dynamic aspect. So it's something that it is quite simple. And uh, basically, uh, this is the value function. I also talked about the model. Most likely, you need to think about the model as the transition probability. So given a state, given you are in a state and you take some possible actions, do you know uh, what are the probability of ending into a given state S1 or S2 and S3? So these are the transition probabilities. And also, what is going to be the, the reward? So knowing the transition probability and the reward associated to a given state and action defines your model. So in the example of before, for example, understanding the, the transition probability that is a function of the, uh, the, the, the demand distribution and knowing the reward, it's what defines your model. The last thing I said is that you have a policy to optimize. So the sequential action that you take over time are this sort of policy, defines your policy. And it can be deterministic. So given a state, I will have a specific action that I will take. Or stochastic. So given a, that I'm in a state, I will take a given action with the probability P and one minus P and other action, for example. So it's not always deterministic, the action that I'm going to take. It goes more into a probabilistic setting. Um, the number of possible policies is exponential with the number of states. So as you can see before, as you can imagine the, 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 the graph unfolding that I showed, the state unfolding graph that I diagram that I showed you before, it can expand quite quickly if you have many action and many states. So you have this exponential complexity that is not very pleasant. And that's it. So in the case in which you have uh, a labyrinth, so you have a starting point and you want the agent to learn that these blacks are all walls, so it cannot go there, and this is the actual goal. So assuming that the agent doesn't know where is the goal and doesn't know where are the walls, you want the agent to play and try and move and, and, and do a trial and error till the point it, which it learns the value function it learns the optimal policy, so where to go in each state, and the model that is the reward. And just let me tell you a little bit more about this. So the value function is for each state. Let's assume that each of these coordinates is your state. You do have how good is the state in the sense of how, how likely is that from here you reach the goal. And as you can see, it, the more you go toward the goal, the lower gets the value function, right? 
So, and, and, and if you are here and you need to decide whether to go up or to go down, you will follow the direction of a, a better value function. So in this case, it's is, is better to go for minus 14, right? And is actually indeed the, the best strategy. And even here, you will go for minus 10 rather than minus 12, right? So you want to go toward um, larger and larger positive uh, value functions. And this is translated, but it's for, this is a deterministic policy in which for each state, you know the action that you need to um, take. And this is the model that tells you uh, what do you face for each time you move, you have, a, oops, excuse me, each time you move, you have a minus one reward. So this is if you have a full knowledge. So after all your training and your, your learning of the RAL agent, this is what you would like to achieve a learned value function, an optimal policy that is indeed correct, and a model that you have acquired over time. What is the optimal policy? As you can see, as you can understand, the optimal policy is the one that maximizes your uh, state value function. So as I said before, the state value function, the school function, is really, really uh, the only thing you may want to learn uh, in terms of RL agent, because indeed, once you know that, at each time, you will take the policy that maximizes this value function. So once you have this, you actually have achieved the, the optimal policy, so the optimal strategies over time. And this is a little bit of math. I want to try to keep it light, so uh, you will have this uh, offline, so you may also want to see it later but what i wanted to understand is what we just described before so the value function is simply the expectation over all what over all possible transition that can happen in the future of the reward plus the future value function right so that's it here is just the case in which we 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 explicit the expectation so we we basically say that the value function is the current reward that i will get plus the discounted value function of the future state weighted by the probability, the transition probability of ending up in all those states. And this is what is your model. Ideally, uh, you know that. In practice, you don't know that. And this is what you have to learn. So if you know this, uh, there's nothing to learn. If you know this, you know how to evaluate the Q-value function. You can just apply a dynamic programming computation and you will know the optimal policy. However, the problem is usually you have no idea what is the state value function for each state and action pair, and you have no idea what is the transition probability. And that is when your problem from a Markov decision problem, pro process that is more a mathematical framework of this uh, state action interaction, it becomes a pure RL problem where the agent needs to learn. Um, there are many things that you can learn. Let me just give you to this slide that is a little bit uh, uh, cleaner. So uh, you can then say, okay, let's start from the bottom. So I can actually start, I can learn the model, so this transition probability and rewards, and then I can compute my possible Q value function and optimize my optimal strategy. And this is model-based reinforcement learning because the key goal is to understand the model of your problem. A different aspect is when you say, uh, I don't want to learn the model, but I still want to learn the value function for each state pair, um, uh, state and action pair. And once I know this Q, then I will optimize my policy. Another different strategy is to say, I don't want to learn anything but my optimal policy. So do your magic trick in your uh, black box uh, learning framework in such a way the output is directly the optimal uh, policy that you want to learn. And either if you are learning the value function or directly the policy, you are in a model-free reinforcement learning because you don't get to learn the transition probabilities and all the models that are underneath. And this is a, a key introduction to what RL is, is this uh, interaction of an agent with an environment in which the agent takes action and the environment evolves based on this action. So the environment we saw that is the state, the, the state, and the state changes depending on your action and maybe some uh, uh, probabilistic model underneath. 
the agent needs to understand this interaction and try to understand what is the best strategy and, and action to take. Quickly, because let me see the time, yes, uh, I will also tell you how this learning works. So till, till now we, we set the, the basic uh, understanding on, on, on what you need to do, but how do you learn? So what do you need to learn is either your function or, or your policy, but what do you actually learn? So again, RAL is very infinite as a domain, and I want to really give you the key information, so it should really be uh, a key understanding of, in RL, you need to understand the value function because the value function is what tells you how the state and action pair is for the long-term concept, so for the long-term horizon, that is your final goal. Uh, there are many other strategies, but now I'm going to show you how do you learn the Q value function, so the Q learning algorithm. What happens, for example, in the case of an agent going out of a labyrinth is this what follows. So you are a, a robot, you move, for example, here, and you just keep track or in a lookup table for your state action value function. Here, I only, for, for practicality, I only, stay, I only visualize the state and the value function associated to it, assuming that the action is the optimal one. But you see, you, you were going here, so you observe these states, and then you will have a given knowledge of the state. Then you do another trial, you go down, and now you have an update knowledge on these settings, right? After many iterations, so then ideally reach the point in which you have known uh, the all value functions for all state, or at least you know that with a quite good understanding. And that's what you only need to know to then understand what is the optimal policy to get out of the maze. That's it, uh, okay? But how do you know that? Uh, you know that by uh, TD learning, so time different learning. So every time you take a step, you improve your knowledge. And then you take another step and you improve your knowledge. And this happened with this iterative update. Actually, let me show you exactly. I showed you this slide because you, I, I did the, the temporal aspect. So a time, you have a knowledge of your Q value function. So imagine that you have your lookup table from your previous actions. And it's Q T minus one of state A, S, T, and I, T. But then you observe to take action A, T from state S, T, and then you observe the reward. So the red letters are the new information that comes in as new feedbacks, right? So by definition, the reward that you observe plus the Q value function of the future state, define your Q as T80, right? So this is what is called the target value. So what you should have achieved. But this is what you have stored in your local table. So it's what you, you, was your value till now. And the difference is the gap between what you had at time T minus one and what you have observed now. So it's what is the new value. So basically what you do is, okay, so you update your old value plus this delta. You have an alpha learning factor mainly for avoiding oscillation because each observation might have some randomness. But that's the little bit of thing you do. You say, I have a lookup table with an old value. I observe this reward. This reward tells me that the Q value function should be higher of that delta. So you increase Q of that delta discounted of a given uh, learning rate because again you want to uh, you want to reach convergence, but that's the only thing you do. And, and what you do, one key concept that you might heard over time is you do bootstrap. So you only observe the current reward, not all the future ones that will happen in the future, but you approximate or you estimate will come next with the knowledge of 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 what you have so far. So you bootstrap, so you update, assuming that you do use an estimate of what will happen in the future, okay? Uh, a last thing that is the last concept for this RL part is, uh, I mentioned in Bandit problem that you do have an exploration, exploitation trade-off. Where do we have this trade-off here? Well. We have because let's assume that you are again an agent that needs to get out from a maze. You may try these two 
policy. And that's it. And you say, OK, this is what I observed. And the green path is actually my best one to get out of the maze, which is not actually true, because if you see this one could be shorter, right? But you haven't oops, explored the, um, the ambient enough. You simply took some decisions. At a given time, you assume that this is a good knowledge enough. And then you take your action to say, I only maximize my, my, my cumulative, uh, my state value function, assuming that this knowledge is correct. So in this case, you exploit a little bit too much, but you little exploit, explore. Another setting is the case in which you do explore too much. So you have many trials. You, you try to go all the poss you, you really want to try to visit all the possible states of the maze. And then at the end, you, you do decide that this green is your optimal path which indeed is the optimal path, but it costs you many, many games. So if you assume that you have to pay for every time you do this, 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 this trial, well, that was quite expensive, right? So here you, you do explore a lot, which on one side, it ensures you that your final strategy will be the optimal one, but you will have a very large price. So you again want to find the optimal trade-off. And how you reach that? is with many strategies. One can be the epsilon greedy. So every time you are in a given time t, you need to take an action. And you have to understand if you want to take an action more toward the exploration or more toward the exploitation. So what you do is uh, with the probability 1 minus epsilon, uh, epsilon, you exploit. So you take the action that maximizes your current estimate of the state value function. But with an epsilon probability, you take an action at random. So you just explore. And as you can understand at the beginning, the epsilon value is quite large. So you have more exploration at the beginning. And then the more you try, the more you know, the more you uh, reduce this epsilon. But you always keep it active in such a way that you always keep on refining your model. And that's it. Uh, I hope that was not too much mathematical. But it's really something that it cannot be explained otherwise, because you really need the concept of uh, uh, the evolution over time of states and action, and how this is captured all by the value function. And how you learn that, you learn with the Q-learning, that is a model-free RL, because have you noticed, if you notice, we never talked about learning the probability of the transition between states. We just discussed about learning the, the Q function. And you updated assuming that you have a feedback that improve your knowledge on how the actual Q function should be. And you, you then have a loss function that is what you use to update your current estimate. This is it. Uh, for people that are interested, there is an entire field out there on this, deep learning, meta RL, multi-agent RL. Uh, of course, uh, it's something that there are some pointers at the end. Uh, here, I just wanted to give you the basics because sometimes, in, 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 even in networks, you have these sort of uh, problems in which you have some dependency. For example, some sort of uh, resource allocation strategies, scheduling problems, and aspects like that do have these dependencies over time. Uh, there are some works. Some of them are on Mac, online optimization, and, and frame slots where you do have a dependency, because I guess you are all familiar with Mac, Mac protocols, but uh, this was a specific case in which you have some um, slotted alloa random allocation, but you still need to understand the, 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 the randomness criteria, or, or at least uh, the maximum user you want to serve, or, or other decision in that sense. And you do have a correlation, because your strategy at this frame now uh, that will give some sort of collisions will that have an impact on in the future because for example user might then needs to resend the packets or or any type of other decisions depending on that so there is a sort of uh, interactions over time that was built on and honestly there are many possible problems that um, have been investigated in 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 communication and networking this is a nice uh, survey that kind of shows you uh, four different types of problems from routing. Routing is really the, the key simple 
example that people usually do in, in RL because your action is, is, is you know, part, a small chunk of the route. And depending on what you did before, then it, it also changed the route that you will do next. But it's also many other problems. Again, caching can also be seen as this one, even if we saw it before in bandits, but also uh, rate control and network access. Uh, and the key point compared to maybe network design problems that you might have seen already is that sometimes you do assume that you have a model, maybe even the probabilistic model on, on average, I have uh, this probability for a new user coming in. Uh, but what if you don't have that probability? What if uh, you have this probability, but this is changing over time? So you want the model to actually learn this over time. And this uh, is a little bit what I show you today. I hope uh, you are still with me. I cannot see your faces, so I cannot see your interaction. But uh, um, overall, I, I wanted to show you a, an idea on, we started with defining what machine learning is, uh, can be really generalized as a data set that has to be processed by learning algorithm to understand a classification rule. We then went into more online learning in which we have banded problems and reinforcement learning. They all kind of have this sort of loop, in this case, action and update, and in this case of agent environment. The key difference is that here we don't have an environment that changes over time. Here we have, it would be a degenerative case of online learning, the bandit in which we only have the state, and it doesn't evolve over time, it's only one state. While in this case we have that the state evolve with an agent action. And just to conclude, uh, do I still have a few minutes? Uh, yes. Yeah, Lara, we have some time. Okay, okay, so I will then use the next few minutes, 10 minutes, to, to tell you a little bit more the research that is also uh, behind this, uh, that is uh, how to apply this to networks, right? Uh, or, or, or can I simply take this uh, uh, framework that I show you now that is really uh, the theory that you would see in the book, uh, nothing that is really, uh, well, okay, there is a constant evolution, but what you can see now is really the theoretical framework. Can you just take it and apply it to your network problems? The answer is most likely no. Uh, and that's because uh, uh, this is, was one of the beginning of a slide that we had at the beginning to say, online learning is learning by trial and error, matching the exploration expectation trade-off, and these are the theoretical framework you can use. What I didn't tell you is that you really struggle to get sample or data efficiency. So for you to actually learn enough of the environment, uh, you need to take some uh, steps. So you need to try out many possibilities, right? And the question is, can I make that more efficient? And just to give you an example on why you need that is, I show you the bandit problems, I show you that you have a regret, but the regret scales with the number of arms or, or possible actions that you have, right? And, and, and in a work that I had, I had a source optimization problem. So for example, where should I put sources? And, and that is an entry scale problem. So the number of actions you may have are very large. So it means that the number of trials you have to have are, are really exponentially large. And that is not when you try, it's wrong. There is a penalty, right? That uh, there is a cost that you pay. In RL, it's similar. I kind of show you a very simple case in which you have a lookup table. I have to tell you that new advanced techniques use deep nets for uh, learning this rather than learning a lookup table. So when you, talk, when you see deep RL, that is what we mean, that rather than having a lookup table, I have a deep net to learn this model and then tells me the optimal strategy or Q function. But I stick for the moment to the lookup table. I need to learn this, but some games or some scenarios, they have, for example, the, 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 the Go game as 10K states and even higher. And, and learning a lookup table for all the states or learning something that has been approximated the value function, it would really be, it is unfeasible. So uh, this is the use case I was describing before. <clears throat> For example, one, I this because I think it's really something that I was looking into the social network problem, but it really fits also to network problems, at least 
in my mind, that is a source optimization. So let's assume in this example is an advertisement agency that needs to place uh, some ads to people. And assuming that because of some interaction and connection that happen between people by social platform or anything, the fact that maybe I, I share this ad or share this link or share that I bought this problem, then can lead to also all the other people to say, I actually like this product, right? Uh, and, and, and so the question is, what is the minimum amount of information and where I should put it in such a way that I maximize the people that like my product or, or share that? And in net networks, to me, it would be the same, like where should I place, uh, place access points or any type of other resource in such a way I got uh, the optimal service at the end. So this is an optimization problem if I know this function, right? But we discuss about today the fact that most of the time you don't know this. First, because this might be really too complicated to learn, to model it mathematically, or because you really have no a priori information. You have in a scenario that it's an emergency scenario has just been built in, so you really have no idea what will happen and which resources you will need, how many people or end user you will have, right? And, and the key intuition is that this problem, okay, this is what I just told you. You need to select uh, uh, out of n possibility, maybe key sources. Uh, you need to learn this mapping, but that's really with the number of functions that you might have to pay people, or at least it takes ages to converge. So the key intuition that uh, at least this is part of the research that I do, and I found it very interesting, mainly for people that work on networks, is that here you are current state-of-the-art algorithm uh, completely ignore the fact that there is a hidden pattern between these users or locations, right? So there is a correlation between users, and here is not used, is not exploited. So all these users, they are connected anyhow, somehow and they are connected by social platform or, or, or geographic proximity, anything. And ignoring this, it's really inefficient. So this new trend of research is how about we do have these users that they are in a vertex domain, vertex with the notation of graphs. And, and I want to take action and observe the reward in this domain of, of the network, right? But there is no point why I could not learn in a spectral or sparse domain. So if I could understand this correlation and this network, then I could learn key parameters of the network in a spectral domain. And that's basically the key intuition. And uh, at least the, the approach that people are using, some people are using, what well, is the one that I'm, I'm using now, is to explore graph signal processing to have this analogy between something that I observe on the vertex domain, that is my sig signal, but then I can model uh, in the frequency domain. So you can really think of that as a, a, a Fourier transform aspect. I will not have time to tell you everything about GSP. Uh, I just put here some key pointers because uh, um, they're very magazine tutorial oriented reading. So for people that are curious about it, it would be interesting. What is really essential is that when you have a topology, for example, a graph that can explain any regular structure, so most of your scenario in the network could fit here, you may have a, a signal on the graph. In my source, optimization would be the appreciation, for example, the sum up, sum down, or that kind of thing. And what is really important is, okay, you can define the graph with the uh, degree metrics and, 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 and the adjacent C metrics, and you define your graph Laplacian. And that's really important because I want it, excuse me, to go here, exactly. So that's very important because I guess you are familiar with Fourier transform. So a signal could be then mapped into a frequency domain and then could remap again in, in, the, in, in, the, in the signal domain. That's the same for graphs. You have a signal on the graph that is highly regular, but it has some structure in this spatial domain that is characterized by the underpinning graph. You can thus process with, with a, a graph Fourier transform that is really the analog, analogous of Fourier transform into a graph spectral domain. So you basically get the Laplacian and you use 
this as the basis of your spectral representation. And, and, and this is still allows you to go back to your signal. But the key point is that the eigenvectors, they have a kind of sort of uh, uh, low frequency and high frequency behavior. So if you see, for example, this is a geographic map where the graph is your topology of a city. And these are few eigenvectors that are derived. You can see that the zero one is a DC component. And the more I go toward high frequency models, the more I add details, right? So a function that is very smooth on graphs, so doesn't have abruptly changes in the spatial domain, can actually be fully modeled by the first small k eigenvectors, for example. So here you have that the signal is a function of all the n eigenvector, but you could have a sparse representation, so only considering the first k, for example, if your signal is very smooth. And it is very something useful in these learning problems. I will not go into these details, but this is the type of research, for example, that we are tackling now at UCL, of trying to merge GSP and online learning to try to have that the inferring problem happens more in the graph spectral domain, graph dictionary, graph eigenvectors, and all that kind of domain, which is usually really sparse. So the scale, I don't have a suboptimality that scale with the high dimensional domain of the graph, but it scale with the sparse dimension of the, the, the spectral domain. And this for your information is some example. So we are applying to a uh, recommendation system of users where users have some sort of correlation or, or dependency over time, source optimization problem. And in reinforcement learning, we try to see the structure in the states so if I see an environment, these are all the states. These states can be seen as nodes on a graph, and the value function can be seen as a signal on the graph. And that's very useful to approximate my value function. So that's it. That was a very quick uh, extra uh, beyond the more uh, scholastic introduction to RL and, and Bandit to show you an idea. And for your information, I will share these that are uh, all the possible resources uh, that are many, I really wanted to put a lot, so you're free to read uh, as much as you want. And with this, I just let me unshare. Great, thank you, Laura. You're welcome. So that was a, you know, a very wide kind of uh, overview of uh, reinforcement learning and a bit of graph signal processing. Uh, so I'm checking here to see whether we have any questions. Um, I don't see any. Uh, so if, if anybody has any questions, please raise your hand or um, you know feel free to unmute. Um, otherwise, I mean, I guess you know what is in all our minds is um, you know we're physical layer people, so where can we apply you know this stuff? So I mean, I see a lot of so reinforcement learning is all about adapting to change. So I mean. I guess there's plenty of applications where we have changing channels, changing conditions, changing network parameters. So stuff like, uh, you know, beam steering in, in physical layer communications or, you know, some sort of channel adaptation. Uh, then you talked about this graph signal processing uh, and, re and this uh, reinforced learning. Again, you, we have stuff. So Marco, just before you was presenting stuff about where to place your access point, as you said. Yeah. Yeah. In our project in Painless, we also talk about where best to, to navigate your uh, drone or your UAV to serve the user. So plenty, I think, of applications there. Yeah, uh, that was we, one of the main applications that when I was thinking on, on, on what to talk about in terms of ML, mm -hmm. uh, I thought that could be one of the applications. It was one of the applications I had in mind. Yeah, yeah. I think so. I think there's plenty. I mean, uh, yours was kind of a more high level kind of uh, description, I think, which is what we want uh, for this tutorial. But there's plenty of stuff to dig into, you know, um, in more detail. Uh, resource allocation is one of the things. A lot of our ESRs are working on unlicensed spectrum and cognitive radio. Exactly. Uh, you yeah. know, turning on and off base stations, antennas, energy efficiency. So these kind of problems, I think they all could benefit. You know, from these yeah. kind of average you showed. One thing that I have to say, one thing that I, at least when I was, I was working more at the Mac layer and, and higher layer, but uh, I, I think that bandits could be very, very useful because they're very simple and they don't have this temporal um, dependency. 
so for it really it's really two words so for some problems like where to place a base station that might not really have it depends if you want to see it as more like i want to place this and this is what happens or i want to place this and this is what happens and then i change but you know base station placement is not something that you can take actions over time you take maybe from time to time but not constantly so I unless think, you're using a drone yeah as a base station okay exactly that would exactly so depending on the time frame of your action i think it tells you also whether you are more in classical bandit so you take action you observe but this is not happening really too often or in RL in which you have these dependencies. So drones would be much more into RL frameworks. Yeah. And it depends also on the uncertainty that you have. But since uh, I saw that you might also want to tackle emergency situation or, or some scenarios that has to be built up, you might not really have a lot of priors on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think that's uh, also a key kind of bit of research. So how to do with limited uh, bits of uh, priors yeah. and learning. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, very good, very good. Uh, so I think this is useful and we, I think you have a lot more content in the full set of slides, no? Which yeah, exactly, content? yeah. Okay, exactly. thanks a lot for that. And I know it's, uh, there is quite mass, so it's not very easy to process at the beginning. This is why I think with the slides, you might also go back and no problem. Yeah. <laughs> get them. So unless we have any other question uh, uh, that I cannot see right now, there's something in the chat. Uh, no, it's not a question. So unless we have anything, uh, okay. In that case, uh, uh, thanks again, Laura, for, for spending your time to, to give us a seminar. And uh, yeah, um, I think uh, we'll take a break now, a bit of a coffee break, a bit of a co poster break, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll come back with our kind of media exploitation training. Uh, I'd like to remind everybody also to please submit your feedback if you haven't done so. I, I placed uh, the link for your feedback on the chat here so you can find it. And I'll see you guys in about half an hour. Okay, thanks again, Lara. Bye, you're welcome. Bye-bye.